Sopa University. I welcome you all um, to this session, which is arranged by International Relations Program on recommendation of our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Ahmed Sahid Minhas. Um, well, in this uh, session, we will learn and discuss about one of the most challenging and troubling issue of this time, uh, which is, of course, the political crisis in Afghanistan. Um, we know that our Western neighbor has been in a great mess since last more than 40 years. That means that four decades and four generations which have been uh, affected by uh, the political turmoil and, and uh, the militancy in this particular country and, and in the region. So uh, it is our utmost responsibility and our duty as a responsible citizen of the world to understand what has happened with Afghanistan, uh, how it has affected our relations with our neighbor and uh, what price have we paid and this anti-region has paid uh, due to this never ending chaos and disorder. Um, well, our students of international relations are young and they mostly don't understand that what is exactly the background of a fun problem. What are the reasons for such an unexpected twist in this situation, uh, which gives an apparently an um, impression of uh, United States of America's policy defeat in Afghanistan. So more importantly, our students want to know that what is going to be the role of all previous and uh, the contemporary stakeholders in Afghanistan and uh, uh, what could be the role of the new stakeholders, especially the China and United States, uh, sorry, China and United Arab Emirates, because we are uh, witnessing so many different developments which were out of uh, general public's expectations. So that is why it is very much uh, relevant for us to know what is going to be the shape of um, this uh, whole scenario. Uh, to discuss uh, such a lengthy and complex case of Afghanistan with too many stakeholders and a lot of Western-based uh, propaganda, it is our objective to conduct a session um, with a comprehensive analysis of 40 years of turmoil in Afghanistan and what now be uh, the role of Pakistan. Um, this is our main, uh, main concern so far. So I'm feeling really glad and thankful to announce that we have with us a renowned geopolitical expert and analyst, Mr. Shahid Raza, who has served as um, director um, South Asian Strategic Stability Institute, Islamabad. Um, thank you so much, Shahid Raza Sahab, for being with us tonight on my request. Your interest in talking to DHSFAS audience is really commendable, and I really appreciate it. Um, and our audience is anxiously waiting to listen to you and your valuable analysis on Afghanistan's uh, situation. But just before it, I want to mention that we uh, not only have audience from uh, the HSFI University, but also from various universities in Karachi, they will be definitely coming and joining us in the session. Um, so I will uh, like to tell you about uh, the present uh, faculty members from the HSFI University. We have Ms. Irma Basi from Management uh, Computer Sciences Department, Fatma Karan from Management Sciences Department, and uh, our some fellows from you know, Karachi University um, and other universities as well. So they are coming. Ms. Sadia Khan is also here. She is uh, from uh, psychology program in, uh, in the HSFI University. So I thank you all for joining our session. And I really appreciate that uh, you people are very much concerned about um, knowing and learning about um, the situation in Afghanistan and how it is going to affect Pakistan. Um, uh, with my uh, word of thanks, I would to ask Mr. Shahid Raza to please uh, carry on. Over to you, Mr. Shahid Raza. Um, hello, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are quite audible, but I would request you to please introduce yourself first and then uh, um, continue with the topic. Thank you. Um, I think you've already given a kind introduction. My name is Shahid Raza. Um, I, uh, I have previously, previously served as the director for Center for Armament and Technology in uh, Sasi, Islamabad. It's a research center. Uh, so this is where we use to research regional politics, regional um, defense markets, and um, uh, security affairs. I intensively worked on Afghanistan, have written about Afghanistan on numerous affairs. I've also been the strategic affairs editor for GVS magazine, which is a monthly geopolitical magazine that publishes from Islamabad. 
Um, I have also worked uh, with various international think tanks and uh, have extensive experience in uh, regional politics and practitioner of political science uh, by profession. Uh, uh, I'm a communications expert at the moment, uh, and my background is in uh, political science. So today's session, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, DHS of our university for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, Sidra Ahmed, Ms. Sidra Ahmed for um, arranging this. So before we begin, I have context of some crossroads of civilizations. Uh, it, it has always been a very imperfect. Uh, it was at the center of the um, so-called great game between the Russian Empire and the British Empire in the 18th. Uh, it was created under the, to prevent the Muslims in the late, late 1800s to prevent a conflict between the Russian Empire and uh, the uh, British Empire that ruled the uh, subcontinent at that time. Ever, it has remained an important, important player in their regional uh, geopolitical makeup, uh, still remains uh, so, but unfortunately, uh, it has also seen extensive uh, conflict for the past 40 years that has had significant humanitarian impact on the Afghan people. Um, they had at least three waves of uh, refugee crisis. Uh, refugees uh, fled to Pakistan. Pakistan has had to deal with three uh, phases of refugee crisis. Fourth one was expected, but this, it is uh, it is far fetched at the moment. But uh, Afghanistan has suffered greatly uh, at the hands of geopolitical powers. And um, I think it is very important to understand the history of Afghanistan, and that is what this session is all about. So in order to begin, I think we have to go back to the history. Which, um, in Back in the 1900s, the Afghan, Afghanistan, I know today, was uh, basically a uh, It was ruled by a, a, by a royal family. Um, and the last of the, those royal families the, uh, was known as uh, King Zahir Shah. Came into power in 1933. Uh, it is believed that uh, under his rule of uh, his neighbors, uh, there were there was no schism between uh, various uh, various factions uh, of Afghan society because Afghanistan is, after all, a multi-ethnic, multicultural state. Uh, people in Afghanistan generally got, got on with each other, and there was no history of uh, of conflict, not at least not to the extent. Um, that we have seen in recent times. So Zahir Shah's rule uh, between 1930s to 19, late 70s, um, I would say early 70s until 1974 when he was deposed by his cousin named um, Daud Khan. So Daud Khan was basically, uh, had been the prime minister of Afghanistan before, uh, for about 10 years. Uh, he was a, an ethnic nationalist uh, and uh, he uh, was kind of removed from uh, his office by uh, King Zahir Shah because he was deteriorating Afghanistan's very important relations with Pakistan uh, because uh, King Daud Khan, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Daud Khan at that time, uh, he promoted uh, the idea of uh, Pashtunistan and uh, other separatist uh, elements inside Pakistan's territory. He extensively supported uh, militant organizations that uh, regularly attacked Pakistan's tribal areas, uh, especially in the in the uh, mid mid sixties uh, with the uh, invasion of Afghan tribes uh, that was ultimately repelled by Pakistan's own tribe and with the help of the Pakistani state. So there, there is a very convoluted, complicated history behind uh, the, the emergence of the Taliban. Uh, most people in the West, they have a very simplistic view of where the Taliban came from uh, and where the uh, instability in Afghanistan emanates. So it, it, it is very important to understand that uh, there is there is this uh, this climate of incubation that we have observed uh, in, in a chronological, in a, in a historic context. So in 1970s, uh, early 70s, when Daoud Khan came to power, the uh, Afghanistan's um, policies, uh, they drastically changed. Um, he adopted a very hostile policy towards Pakistan that deteriorated relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And obviously, Pakistan is very important to Afghanistan's trade. Uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan remains a landlocked, landlocked nation, and it is uh, wholly and solely dependent on Pakistan for international trade. So that had a knock-on effect on um, um, on Afghanistan's economy, and uh, that led to the collapse of uh, Daoud Khan's government. Uh, Daoud Khan was deposed uh, by a communist uh, political party named PDPA, 
it had two factions and um, it, one of them was Hulk, another one was Pershing. So there were two factions of one communist party, PDPA, uh, that was backed by the Soviet Union. It is very important to understand that um, in 19, late 70s, um, the, the idea of uh, state was uh, almost surrounded entirely by Soviet Union. Soviet Union had complete control of the Central Asian Muslim republics, you know, uh, Turkmenistan, um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc. All of these countries were uh, under Soviet occupation, and uh, Soviet Union had enormous influence. Uh, it had uh, uh, an overwhelming advantage in terms of military firepower dynamics in the region. So it kind of um, dominated uh, Afghanistan's politics, and with it started to because it is all unfolded in in a cold war scenario when the world is divided between the us the capitalist west and the communist uh, uh, east the um, soviet led by soviet union so it, it, it is in this context that the soviet union started to support uh, a communist regime uh, that was undemocratic uh, it was pro soviet and it was absolutely brutal uh, it's uh, they started the communist uh, they started a communist revolution in inside afghanistan through the help of the pdpa and they came into they basically seized power from uh, king Daud, uh, uh, prime minister Daud. What happened is that after the communists came into power, they carried on with uh, the nationalist policies of Daoud Khan, but at the same time, they squarely tilted over to the Soviet Union, which uh, created a source of anxiety in the West because they were afraid that the Soviet Union, if um, they managed to take over Afghanistan, uh, they would be a step closer to the Arabian Sea, and uh, the Western powers wanted to control uh, the, the, the Soviet Union uh, from any access to the Arabian Sea because Russia did not have access to warm water, still does not. It only has a few ports that uh, one of the is eight months a year, even still, have is Black Sea, and it was surrounded by the American Navy at that time. So the uh, Soviet Union found itself under a potential siege if they entered into a conflict with the US, um, they would have to face a naval blockade. So this is why the Soviet Union wanted to uh, have access to uh, warm water so they could have an additional uh, route to not only trade, but also to project their naval power uh, in, into a very important region, uh, especially an oil rich region in the Middle East and Persian Gulf. So it is in, in the context of regional geopolitics, the Soviet Union decided to intervene in Afghanistan. First of all, they intervened through PDPA. They supported uh, a communist regime that took over Afghanistan, and then uh, they implemented uh, Soviet Union's agenda of the Soviet Union. But the situation uh, between 1974 to 1979, the situation, political situation in Afghanistan started to deteriorate to a point to where Soviet Union felt that uh, it would be better if they could directly invade Afghanistan, take it over, and then uh, it would it, they would be a step closer to uh, to the warm waters. And obviously, uh, that, what that means is that they were planning a war against Pakistan as well, because uh, Pakistan has uh, access to the to the Arabian Sea, Afghanistan does not. So it, it is under this purview that the Soviet invasion that uh, kind of that created the conflict that we see today in 1979 when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan uh, the PDPA regime the communist regime in Kabul celebrated the invasion they supported uh, the the communist army uh, Soviet army 40th Red Army uh, in in Afghanistan in Kabul uh, they were welcomed with flowers and garlands and all that uh, but what followed would be a horrifying brutal war that was imposed on the people of Afghanistan so when the communists invaded um, it, Bef even before the communist invasion, the rural of Afghanistan was already up in arms against the communist regime, uh, starting from the early 70s because of their policies, uh, because of their repression, and uh, because it was communist, they were removing all symbols of Islam uh, from daily life. Uh, they were imposing secularism uh, by force on uh, the people of Afghanistan, uh, imposing communist ideology on the people of Afghanistan, and that created resentment against the, uh, the communist uh, government, which led to a, um, an insurgency against uh, the PDPA government. It's in this context that the Soviet 40th Red Army faced uh, an Afghan resistance as private. So the, the resistance, um, it started in 19, uh, 1979 in a formal sense, but it, it already had existed before. Uh, so uh, with the uh, advent of the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, the Western powers, they decided that they um, could not afford 
uh, a Soviet occupation of Afghanistan because it would ultimately lead to um, the domination of the Arabian Sea or the Indian Ocean even by the Soviet or, uh, Soviet Union, and that that is something that you, that that is something that the Western powers do not want to have. And at the same time, Pakistan of a two-front war scenario uh, emanating from the east and the west simultaneously because India had already uh, attacked and invaded Pakistan in 1971, despite the fact that uh, India and Pakistan had signed a, a peace deal, non-aggression pact in Tashkent after the 1965 war. India was signatory to a non-aggression pact in 60, uh, 1966 after the 1965 war, and when it invaded East Pakistan in 1971, it was a stark violation of the, uh, the non-aggression pact that it had uh, signed signed with uh, Pakistan in Tashkent. So uh, Pakistan was rightfully at the same time the Indian state was developing nuclear weapons. It had uh, its first nuclear device not too far away from Pakistan's border in Pokhran in 1974. And the Pakistan was deeply concerned that India, uh, if it acquires a significant nuclear capability, it would not only be able to blackmail Pakistan, but also might be able to uh, invade Pakistan from the east while the Soviet Union does from the west. So that was a two-front war scenario that Pakistan had faced in, in that particular period, and it was a uh, horrifying con uh, it was a horrifying prospect for Pakistan uh, in 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 the. Uh, in the 70s and in the 80s as well. So it is that Pakistan wanted to uh, protect its interest in, in an operation cyclone. The operation cyclone was a joint operation based um, in, inside Afghanistan with the help of the Western countries, with the help of some Arab countries. Uh, the objective was to drive the forces uh, back, in, uh, back into Soviet Union and feed them as they can over have foothold in um, in Afghanistan or beyond. So the Operation Cyclone started in 1979, and um, the insurgency um, the, known as the Mujahideen in uh, in Afghanistan uh, they fought the Soviet Union in a ferocious battle that uh, that killed uh, over um, uh, one million Afghans at the hands of the, the of the 40th Red Army uh, and their communist allies of PDPA, and it created one of the largest refugee crises of 20th century, uh, over 7 million refugees uh, were received by Pakistan only. And um, that, that happened because the Soviet Union had uh, uh, a collective punishment strategy uh, that they had implemented against uh, the, the Afghan people. So they, they would uh, bring in their aircraft and helicopters and they would uh, completely destroy Afghan villages. Uh, they would take women as prisoners, they would kill all of the men, and all, they, they would also incarcerate or kill all of the children that would that were believed to be uh, reaching uh, military age service, which is believed to be around 15 to 16 years of age. So they, they would tie up uh, Afghan children with a rope and throw them in a pond, so their collective weight would actually sink them. Th these are recorded cases that have been recorded by Amnesty International and other uh, human rights organizations. So uh, because of the Soviet uh, human rights abuses in Afghanistan uh, and their scores earth policy, their collective policy in Afghanistan, it, it intensified the resistance against the Soviet Union and PDPA. So what happened is that when 7 million refugees started to flow into Pakistan, uh, most of the men who came in, they would drop their families in Pakistan in refugee camps. They would go back, they would join training camps and they would go back and jo join the jihad against uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union. And for 10 years, uh, Afghanistan, Afghan resistance made up of seven different uh, Mujahideen factions and 40, 40th Red Army of the Soviet Union and uh, their communist PDPA allies, the, the Afghan military at that time, uh, they fought a ferocious battle uh, for 10 years. And uh, it, at the end of the day, in by, 19, uh, by 1988, uh, the Soviet Union had realized that they were going to lose the war. It, basically, Soviet Union in 1988 was in the same position as what America finds itself in in 2021. So they um, they basically sued for peace. Uh, they signed a deal with Pakistan. They signed a deal with the U.S. Uh, under the so-called Geneva Accords in 1988. And under the Geneva Accords, the Soviet Army withdrew in 1989 from Afghanistan. The 40th Red Army had been defeated, and they left Soviet Union. Uh, they left Afghanistan for Soviet Soviet territory. The um, victory of the Mujahideen uh, created a balance, it created a vacuum of power in 1989 inside Afghanistan. They could not decide who is going to rule 
Afghanistan, they could not come to a conclusion that uh, they are, uh, for example, uh, for a power sharing formula in Afghanistan, and that ultimately created uh, the Afghan civil war in the early 90s. Uh, it, was, it was a war that was fought between the former uh, Mujahideen factions. So they basically, after they had defeated the Soviet Union, they went back to fight, start, they started to fight among themselves. Uh, and try to to have a military solution to who's going to govern Pakistan or how uh, sorry who's going to govern Afghanistan and how it is going to be governed uh, what kind of state it will be uh, so there were a lot of differences between various Mujahideen factions and in starting from the early 90s all the way to 1996 there was a ferocious civil war uh, between the Northern Alliance and uh, what later became known as the uh, the Taliban so uh, ultimately by 1996. Uh, the Afghan civil war ended when the Afghan Taliban defeated all other factions and uh, took over much of uh, Afghanistan except uh, the Panjshir Valley and adjacent small small adjacent areas where uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud remained strong and uh, it was not conquered by the Taliban. The, uh, the Taliban took over in 1996 and uh, they established a the so-called uh, the um, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and they created their own government. They created their own system inside Afghanistan that was governed uh, under very strict interpretations of uh, their particular set of ideology. Uh, the uh, the Taliban government was not recognized by international community uh, by at large, except uh, for Pakistan and UAE, and to an extent Saudi Arabia. So it, the uh, the Taliban government remained in isolation. So this is something that this again created another vacuum because the Americans, after the the Soviet withdrawal, they left. They did not provide any uh, economic uh, assistance to Afghanistan. They were not part of any political solution in Afghanistan. Uh, they did not help rebuild the infrastructure in Afghanistan that had been completely destroyed by the Soviet invasion. So it created a huge a huge vacuum in which other forces. Uh, started to have their influence, and one of those forces was uh, were Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda had a very long history in the Afghan Jihad. They had been fighting against the Soviet Union. They were bringing uh, fighters from all across the Arab world to fight the Soviet Union, and uh, their um, uh, their uh, involvement, Al Qaeda's involvement in Afghanistan, continued throughout uh, the 1990s, uh, and they were part of the uh, uh, the Afghan civil war as well. And then when the Taliban government came in, the uh, Al Qaeda they uh, recognized Taliban government and they uh, supported them in every way possible. And, and it, it is in, in this particular time frame, uh, Osama bin Laden also permanently moved over to Afghanistan because he was uh, removed from Sudan uh, at, uh, because of the American and Saudi pressure. So uh, it is in this context, it is in this time frame that Al Qaeda uh, became very strong in. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan, because they were, they had a lot of uh, funds available to them, and they were fulfilling a lot of the the economic needs uh, that were being left uh, in in Afghanistan. Um, and obviously, because Afghanistan was not being recognized, uh, they did not have international uh, monetary institutions working in Afghanistan as well. So it created a huge financial vacuum that enabled uh, the, the Al Qaeda to have a significant sway in uh, Afghanistan's affairs in this particular time frame. So starting from 1996 onwards uh, till uh, the 9-11 happened in, 2000, uh, in 2001. So in, in 2001, uh, September 11th, 2001, um, there were attacks in uh, New York City and in Washington, D.C. Uh, against Pentagon and World Trade Centers. The attacks were blamed on Al-Qaeda uh, and the Americans uh, launched uh, this, their uh, uh, so-called war on terror. And um, in this, it is in this context that the American involvement in Afghanistan began in 2001. Uh, they landed their forces, a small contingent of their forces in Panjshir Valley in October 2000. Uh, late September to early October 2001, uh, they teamed up with uh, the former Northern Alliance factions and uh, they uh, created uh, a military strategy to take over Afghanistan. Uh, this particular force of Northern Alliance mercenaries and uh, the CIA operatives, they um, backed by the US air power, they overthrew the Taliban government within one month. And uh, by the end of October, uh, the government in Afghanistan, the Taliban government in Afghanistan had been removed from power and they had fled uh, down to Kandahar. And in Kandahar, the Taliban offered 
uh, a peace deal to the Americans and they offered to hand over Osama bin Laden if he was, if they only met conditions, if uh, uh, Osama bin Laden was to be tried in a court in a third country, not in the US, but in a third country. Uh, Americans did not uh, agree to these, uh, these terms. Uh, they did not agree to the um, suggestion that they should not actually invade Afghanistan. Uh, frankly speaking, at this particular time, America had met all of its war objectives in one month. They had removed Taliban from, from power. They had destroyed all of the infrastructure that had existed on the behalf of uh, Al-Qaeda or whatever America had believed uh, that had existed uh, on the behalf of Al-Qaeda, especially in Tora Bora and other regions. Uh, they had met all of their objectives by October 2001, but uh, the Americans decided to invade Afghanistan uh, with a full-scale military point that happened and uh, it, it kind of created this endless uh, war that we have seen uh, over the past 20 years. Um, in, two, in early 2000s, uh, if the Indian and Pakistani state, they were at, at uh, you know, uh, arms drawn because uh, Kargil happened in 1999 and it led to uh, further, further escalation between India and Pakistan in 2000. Uh, 2001 and, and uh, it, uh, it, it ended in 2002 uh, with the demobilization of forces. At this particular time, India and Pakistan had deployed all of their military forces on their border and a full-scale war between India and Pakistan was very much likely. When America took over Afghanistan, uh, they signed an agreement with India in 2006. It was, it was an agreement of strategic cooperation between India and, India and the US that enabled India to have a footprint inside Afghanistan. And that is when uh, the Indian state created a, uh, a, a militant proxy, uh, which we know as TTP. TTP would go on with the help of the Indians, uh, with the help of the Afghan state, and obviously with the tacit approval of the Americans to wage a war of insurgency inside Pakistan that uh, most of you are familiar with. This war of, this war of terrorism inside Pakistan uh, killed over 70,000 Pakistanis, including uh, almost 10,000 military and paramilitary police personnel and civilians. Not a single city in Pakistan was remained unaffected. They attacked without discrimination. They attacked mosques, they attacked schools, they attacked hospitals, they attacked ambulances, it, they attacked our ports, uh, they attacked airports, they attacked our aircraft. There was not a single aspect of Pakistani state that was not harmed or attacked under uh, this uh, India-led war of terrorism that started after 2006, uh, after the Americans and the Indians had signed a strategic cooperation agreement uh, between themselves. And uh, it was one of the stipulation that India would uh, kind of create a, a pressure uh, point against Pakistan to draw further concessions inside Afghanistan for the Americans, but that did not happen. Over the next 15 years, the, the, uh, the TTP waged a vicious terrorist campaign inside Pakistan, as I've already stated. Uh, most of you are familiar with what has happened. There are horrifying memories uh, that we all have. And uh, it, it, it is very important to understand the context of the TTP's emergence in Pakistan and why they were created uh, to begin with. At the same time, the Indian state established a massive network inside Afghanistan uh, uh, to train, arm, and uh, dispatch militants inside Pakistan, specifically TTP and uh, militant organizations that continue to function in, in, um, in, in Balochistan. So India had an objective to uh, wage a war of proxy to weaken Pakistan from within. Uh, with, a, with an ambition to have a strategic military edge over Pakistan, so Pakistan can remain either collapses as a state like it happened in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, you name it. Uh, that was the objective, but uh, the objective did not meet uh, because of the resolve of the Pakistani people and its armed forces. And it is very important to say that um, during the last 20 years, uh, Pakistan has faced a significant brunt of uh, uh, of, the, of the security dilemma that emanates from Afghanistan. Obviously, uh, even today, uh, the militants uh, that operate in Pakistan have direct links inside Afghanistan, although uh, it is, uh, it, it, the, the signature of these uh, militant organizations is going to be drastically reduced. In parallel, uh, the Afghan Taliban continue to wage, um, wage a war against the, the foreign occupation. Uh, inside Afghanistan, and uh, it, it uh, rolled in rolled into a large-scale insurgency for about 20 years. 
And by 2015, the Americans had figured out that they had um, uh, they had to get out of Afghanistan uh, after having signed a peace agreement with the Taliban. Uh, that is something that Pakistan had been saying since 2001, that America should go for a diplomatic solution rather than trying to impose a costly war inside Afghanistan. But uh, Pakistan's advice was not um, accepted by the Americans because uh, they were under the influence of Indians who believed that there was a square and fair military solution that could be imposed inside Afghanistan. But obviously, uh, that did not happen. So what we see is that in the late uh, 2015, uh, there was a significant exchange of uh, negotiations between uh, between um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Taliban, Afghan Taliban, and the Americans, and it led to the Doha Agreement in Qatar, uh, which paved the way for a uh, the exit of U.S. forces from Afghanistan on the eve of 9/11 in 2021, which is uh, just a few days away from now. And this brings us to the current, most current situation, the reconquest of Afghanistan by the Taliban. Um, I think it would be better if uh, we could answer this in, uh, in a question and answer session, but uh, I would just go over, um, over this phenomena in, in, a, in a very brief fashion. The Taliban have not uh, actually imposed a military solution for the reconquest of Afghanistan, which is unfolding right now. Uh, they have taken over most of the most of the country without any resistance from the Afghan National Army. Afghan National Army was inducted and trained uh, mostly from the Northern Alliance factions. Then uh, they also recruited from the Pashtun belts of Afghanistan in order to stabilize their demographics. However, they have also spent $85 billion on building uh, the Afghan National Army, uh, equipping and training the Afghan National Army over the past uh, 20 years. But what we saw was a spect spectacular surrender of the Afghan National Army. They did not even fight, except for two provinces where the fighting did not last more than two days. And the Taliban managed to seize um, most of their provinces without uh, significant fighting, without significant uh, uh, civilian casualties, and uh, without actually having to uh, wait or, or lay a siege uh, the same thing happened in Kabul uh, when, they, when the Taliban uh, took over surrounding districts of Kabul. Uh, the, the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, it is stated that he left, fled the country with $169 million in cash. Um, the Afghan National Army psychologically collapsed when that happened, and uh, they did not offer any resistance to the Taliban. The Taliban moved into the presidential palace and uh, carried out a smooth transition of power uh, over to the, the Taliban. Now, uh, they are in the process of uh, negotiations to form uh, a negotiated um, across the board representative government in Afghanistan. They have stated that we do not want to become the only rulers, which means that they are not going to repeat the mistakes of 1996. We have also heard just now that the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, who controls the Panjshir Valley, um, he has uh, reportedly pledged allegiance to uh, the the Amir of the Taliban, Hibatullah Akhundzal. So this, uh, in effect, ends uh, the 40 years of conflict that happened in Afghanistan. Uh, it is unfair to see Afghanistan's conflict. Uh, in the last 20 years context, because uh, it really isn't 20 years. It, it started uh, in late 70s or mid 70s at least. So it, it's been almost 20 to 20, uh, 40, 45 years of conflict in Afghanistan uh, that has um, ostensibly come to an end. And uh, I would be happy to discuss the future of Afghanistan uh, in the Q&A session. And especially if you have any questions regarding uh, this of Afghanistan, I will be glad to take questions now. Uh, over to you, Sidra.
Sintra, are you able to hear me? Hello, am I audible yeah. to everyone? Yes, over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Shahid Raza Saab, for such an uh, extensive and comprehensive analysis of the history of Afghanistan's crisis. And I'm really happy for my students, especially because they are very young and uh, in this stage, it is it was very helpful for them to understand uh, the political crisis, uh, which this uh, entire region is facing since last 40 years, more than 40 years, in fact. So uh, it was a very good effort from your side. And uh, I really thank you uh, for speaking to our audience. Uh, they are not just from uh, DHS Super University. University. They were joining from different institutes in Karachi, and you are now uh, very familiar uh, with the different institutes in Karachi. We will definitely like to invite you, inshallah, sometime in person in some conference or some workshop uh, so that you can uh, personally interact with our students and audience. Thank you very so much. So, I would like to ask uh, my pleasure. And uh, the first question is uh, from my own side that uh, I just want to know that. What do you think that is this the end of Western uh, West dream of uh, hegemony over Eurasian land? Do you really think like that? Thank you. I think uh, it's a very interesting to have because the Americans or the West, um, they have uh, an evolving set of geopolitical ambitions. Um, it, mostly they're, the power of the West emanates from their economic muscle rather than military muscle. Um, one thing is for certain that the West will not be able to exercise the impunity that they have been able to exercise in the greater Eurasian belt after their exit from Afghanistan because they do no longer have military footprint in the region. Uh, but uh, it, it is at the same time uh, very important to understand that the Americans have recently initiated a quad plus um, organization which Pakistan is a part of. Uh, along with um, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan and the U.S. itself. So what they're trying to do is that they're trying to, uh, to, to create a an economic framework in which certain uh, American leverage in this region will certainly remain. Because as I've stated, if you talk about the international financial institutions, the American relevance in the region is not going to diminish, which is again a positive thing because uh, the, the problem begins when there's a military deployment, there's an invasion uh, and occupation of a certain country in your region. That is, that is a toxic influence. But everyone uh, in this region could benefit from the economic rivalry of China and the US, because if China and the Americans continue to counter invest each other in the region, um, in a strategic sense, it is in the benefit of, of these countries, because it will help them build infrastructure, it will help them build uh, their economies, uh, industries, uh, they will be better connected with each other. So China has the Shanghai Cooperation Organization framework in, in the Central Asian Belt. The Americans are trying to create the Quad Plus uh, initiative in, in the Central Asia, which again, Pakistan is a part of. TAPI is a US-backed uh, project, which Pakistan is a part of. CAREC, C-A-R-E-C, is a regional connectivity project that is again backed by financial institutions that are backed by the US and part of CARC. It is, uh, it is running and being built in parallel to CPEC in the Central Asian region. So the answer is yes and no. Uh, economically, absolutely yes. Uh, but in military, strictly military terms, absolutely not. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Shahid Saab. I have a question from our faculty side, Ms. Fatima Kiran from uh, Humanities and Social Sciences Department. Uh, she has a question uh, that has there been a generation, generational change in Taliban leadership and does this indicate any possibility of a less hard line than 1996 till 2001? Alternatively, have they learned more about politics, negotiations and diplomacy during that time? Definitely, because look, Taliban have made serious mistakes after taking over 1996. Uh, they were not ready for running a country. They, they had no idea about geopolitics. They had no about, idea about international relations. They um, did not believe in the idea of international financial institutions. But this particular Taliban that we are seeing right now, uh, they are very well prepared for uh, actually governing a country. They are uh, sending 
subtle messages to the international community that if you work with us, we will work on the social reform agenda, especially uh, the right of uh, women in Afghanistan. Uh, and they have been engaging with global powers one-on-one, -on -one, bilaterally speaking. So they have dealt with the Americans on a bilateral level. Uh, they have spoken to Iran at a bilateral level. They have spoken to China, Russia, uh, and many other countries at bil bilateral level. So they have a lot of exposure as far as international politics is concerned. So 20, um, 20, uh, 20 years of evolution, certainly. I think they have realized their own uh, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, we can certainly expect that the Taliban we will see now uh, are not the Taliban of 1996. Because uh, if it had been the case, then they don't really have to uh, kind of negotiate with the... Um, uh, the, the, the factions they have been fighting for 20 years. You know, they, they don't have to talk to Ahmad Shah Massoud's son because he's completely irrelevant. Panchir Valley is surrounded. From the perspective, stand no chance of resistance because Panchir Valley is effectively a chokehold right now. Uh, they would not have invited uh, Hazaras, they would not have invited Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, and so certain other factions in Afghanistan. But at the same time, uh, what we are seeing is, a, is an upward trend. They are not only effectively rebranding themselves in the international community, they are appearing on international media, they are speaking in English, they are conducting press conferences. To an extent, um, I think uh, th there is a change. There, there is definitely evolution in the Taliban. But how far uh, and how long lasting it's going to be is kind of remains, I, I think it remains to be seen. Okay. Um, so, Shahid, there is. Uh... Um, an interconnected question from Fatima's side uh, again, and she asked that how much genuine support does the Taliban have among locals on the ground? Because there is a lot of propaganda about the support or uh, not having it. So what do you think about it? Um, if you're fighting an insurgency and you don't have local support, you're never going to win. All so right. they, they have a lot of local support, uh, especially from the rural belt in Afghanistan. Um, they have kind of um, managed to, you know, uh, hold these areas because of the public support they have. They have far less support in other major cities in Afghanistan, but uh, in rural areas they enjoy a lot of support, especially from the from the tribal uh, section of uh, the the tribal system of Afghanistan. Okay, uh, we have four more, a few more questions from our audience side. Uh, I would recommend you people if you want to. Speak on mind, uh, mic, sorry. Uh, so you may raise your hand and uh, I will talk, uh, take you online so that you can ask the question directly to Mr. Shahid Raza. Uh, there is a question from Zilli Hassan. Sai Zilli Hassan, would you like to speak on mic instead? And we have Emma Khalid uh, with a question and Muneeb also, right? So let me uh, read the Muneeb's question why United Nations hasn't responded to any problem why are they not trying to help the people in Afghanistan? Half the population is starving and United Nations hasn't done anything to help. There is a great criticism on United Nations uh, from Muneeb Dalkota's side. So what will you say, Shahid Sir? Who is the biggest financier of United Nations? The US, right? Yes, <laughs> and they have, they have. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's interesting that when Americans want to pressurize you, they can use charity institutions. They can blockade your food. They can, I mean, they can do anything they want, right? So the UN uh, inaction on the part of the UN, especially, I would be more concerned that the United Nations Security Council has not allowed Pakistan to speak two times. That is more upsetting for me. Uh, I understand that the, the committees were chaired by India, but we actually voted for India uh, when they were contesting the election for the United Nations Security Council, but they don't have the decency to even allow Pakistan to speak, which is interesting. Uh, but uh, the role of the UN as far as humanitarian operations is concerned, UN has always been a failure. It's, I, I mean, it's uh, not a surprise because they haven't really managed to conduct humanitarian operations to an extent uh, that they would make a significant impact uh, on the outcome of the, of the conflict or, uh, you know, kind of um, reduce the suffering of the people in, in conflict zones. Uh, this is not just specific to Afghanistan. Uh, if you remember uh, the Srebrenica massacre in Kosovo, uh, it happened because of the inaction of the UN. Uh, the people who were, the Kosovites who were murdered, Muslims basically, 
uh, who were murdered by uh, the, the Serb forces in Srebrenica, they were under protection of the UN at that time of the Dutch army, but the Dutch army did not fight. So it's, it's not surprising that the UN is uh, unable <laughs> or unwilling to, uh, to do what its mandate is because look at what they've done with Kashmir, look at what they've done with Palestine. I mean, UN has a very specific set of uh, agenda when it comes to providing relief to Muslims because none of the Muslim states have uh, the leverage or the power in the United Nations Security Council. So they can't really, they can't create agenda or they can't move agenda, they can't put their message across and uh, uh, look at what's happening in, with Rohingya, Rohingyas, right? What's happening uh, uh, in Kashmir or, uh, you know, Palestine or other countries um, uh, in Syria or Libya. Um, it, it's okay. ridiculous, yeah. but... I... There is a comment from Munib said that uh, this is does this mean that United uh, Nations is also a puppet? It would be a far fetched thing to say that they are. Another, another very interesting uh, comment from uh, Gansham Rathor, and he said, is it pre planned? Uh, what is pre planned? Um, evacuation of US Army. Yeah, of course it is pre planned. They signed a deal with the Taliban. Okay. So uh, we have another question from Amir Hussain, who is assistant professor in Khadim Ali Shah Bukhari Institute of Technology. Um, Mr. Amir Hussain, uh, he said that what, in your opinion, were the objectives of the uh, United States of America's invasion of Afghanistan? And uh, was it was as simple as removing Taliban government? The second question is Taliban get successful in forming an stable government. Will it help Pakistan economically and strategically? The U.S. war objectives in Afghanistan, they were uh, multifaceted objectives. The first objective was to make military industrial complex rich through endless wars. That was the objective. Second objective was to consolidate drug trade because Afghanistan produces over six to $10 billion worth of drugs every year. Uh, it has $1 trillion worth of lithium reserves. Uh, Afghanistan is very as a very mineral rich country, which is why India is interested, which is why India is so um, disappointed at this time uh, to see what has happened to their investments in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that the U.S. Advocate, they, they have been economic, they have been military, uh, they have to do with raw materials, they have to do with drug trade. They have to do with the ability to place checks and balances and controls over countries that are around Afghanistan, such as Pakistan, such as Iran, such as China, such as Russia, Central Asia. Uh, though all of those countries are seen as either adversaries to the US or potential adversaries. So geopolitically speaking, the, um, the objectives, the war objectives of the US were multifaceted. Uh, it, it is not uh, as simple as removing the top. Second uh, question was uh, whether if, if there is a stable government in Afghanistan, is it going to benefit Pakistan? In retrospect, absolutely yes. Pakistan wants access to Central Asia. Central Asia wants access to Pakistan, especially Gawadar. If we manage to connect Central Asia with Pakistan, uh, uh, going to be a huge game changer. I have written an article uh, about this uh, a few months ago, if anybody wants to read that article, you can uh, find it on my Twitter account. Um, it, it's um, it, it's just an it's just an interesting uh, mix of uh, uh, geographic connectivity and market integration between Pakistan and Central Asia. Let me remind you that in a Central Asian context, Pakistan is the biggest country in Central Asia by population, by by GDP, uh, by economy, uh, by military strength, etc. Pakistan is a very significant player as far as the dimension is concerned. So if uh, we, if Pakistan is able to secure access to Central Asia and Central Asia is able to secure access to uh, Pakistani ports such as Gawadar, such as Karachi, I think it's going to be a huge game changer for the regional integration and it will have a marked and visible uh, uh, geopolitical, strategic and economic uh, impact on Pakistan's economy, positive impacts. Okay, uh, Mr. Shahid Arda, if you have time, we have a few more questions from a student's side. I would recommend my students to please speak on mic and ask your question directly to Mr. Shahid uh, so that he may hear you 
uh, and uh, if needed, then he will ask some question back to you, right? Uh, Jale Hassan and Ahmed Khalid, because you want to speak on online, so please, I'm unmuting you and ask your question now. Yes, Ahmed. Talha Sarbazi, I will come to you, inshallah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is that uh, now that Taliban are in power, uh, the Pakistani establishment seem to be very happy. So my question is that what benefits or threats do Pakistan face from the uh, government of Taliban and from the administration of Taliban? Because back in the day, it was all over the news that many TTP leaders were uh, released uh, a couple of days ago. So my question is that apart from the benefit, because Pakistan established to uh, Taliban seem to be very pro Pakistani and a very anti Indian that Pakistan establishment seems to be very happy about. So my question is what benefits or threats do Pakistan face by the uh, by the... um did you mean by Pakistan establishment? I might always talk like this. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand the question. I mean, uh, it's just um, look. It's it's not uh, Can I please, about. Can elaborate your question? Well, I meant the establishment plus the state GM. plus the uh, government of Pakistan. Okay, right. So, um, look. First of all, uh, what are the benefits? I think I've already elaborated in the previous answer that regional integration is in the benefit of Pakistan. We want to reach Central Asia. Central Asia wants to, wants to reach us. We want to integrate CPAC with Central Asia. Central Asia wants the reciprocal action. We want um, access to various energy reserves that exist in Central Asia, especially in the Caspian Sea region because Pakistan is a growing economy. We need, uh, we need energy. Uh, and <clears throat> there are obvious benefits, but uh, it's, it's, you specifically mentioned the release of the Taliban leaders uh, from jail in Afghanistan. Uh, there are two things that you need to understand. Number one, there was a statement from the Afghan Taliban in which they have clearly stated that there is absolutely no space for TTP in Afghanistan. Number two, the uh, leader of the TTP, the Amir of TTP, um, Mir, uh, Nur Wali Masood, has pledged allegiance to the head of uh, the Amir of Tariqa Taliban of Afghanistan. Um, what that means is that now uh, they have to abide by the charter of the, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which includes Doha Agreement, which includes that Afghanistan soil is never going to be used against its neighbors. Um, in the, the, uh, the, 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 there was a recent statement from TTP in which they have uh, denied uh, having carried out the terrorist attack in Dasu. Uh, Earlier, they claimed that they had attacked uh, Dasu, and this happened after the Taliban uh, visited Beijing, and they offered guarantees to the Chinese state uh, that Chinese uh, the Afghan soil is never going to be used against the, uh, against China, uh, and TDP had to retract its claim uh, over the Dasu attack, which is again a very interesting thing to do because TDP has never retracted uh, its statements before. Uh, earlier, going. About two years ago, uh, the uh, the <clears throat> the Afghan Taliban had issued a charter of demands to the TTP. Uh, there were 25 demands in which they stated that um, if they want to remain inside Afghanistan, they have to um, implement these 25 demands. And those demands included that they are never going to be able to attack Pakistan from Afghan soil, among other demands. Uh, but it is very interesting uh, because the uh, Afghan Taliban see TTP as a potential threat. Uh, that is because the TTP had very deep-rooted links with the Afghan intelligence, NDS, uh, with the Indian intelligence services, based especially based in Kandahar. Uh, they had uh, very close links with the Americans. Um, and uh, the ISKP, when it was formed in 2016 in Afghanistan, most of the fighters of the, uh, the Islamic State in Khorasan province were uh, loaned from Sabati Taliban, which are, which, are, which are basically a TTP faction. So in retrospect, the ISTP does not actually exist. Uh, it is a rebranded form of Sabati Taliban, Sabati faction, Sabati Halka of the, the, the TTP. So they did not come out of thin air, right? 
So <clears throat> another aspect is that um, uh, the TTP also has intersection with the American mercenary groups like Blackwater. Uh, Blackwater has worked very closely with TTP. They have carried out multiple attacks inside Pakistan as well. And uh, they, in, in, in the same time, at the same time, uh, TTP has worked very closely with NDS under the banner of ISKP to attack Taliban. And th this is, again, I, I started my presentation with, with stating that this is not as simple as people think. It's a very convolu convoluted, very complicated co uh, conflict, and it needs to be understood in a, in a very uh, evolving fashion. Uh, so to say that uh, it will, uh, the, the TTP are now um, a, th a th threat to Pakistan, certainly they can try and become a threat to Pakistan. But uh, uh, from my perspective, the TTP is now stuck between Pakistan and Taliban. It, it, they have a very uh, slim chance of survival. TTP has uh, TTP has understood and learned firsthand uh, what it is uh, to lose a battle. They lost all of their area in Fata. They um, they had um, uh, significant casualties in Zarbiazm to an extent that they had to send uh, small kids and sick fighters, fighters who had been admitted into hospitals to come and fight. So they lost most of their human resource. According to a UN report, as, much, as many as 9,000 TTP fighters exist in Afghanistan. And uh, now they have a choice between either uh, they sign a peace deal with Pakistan uh, and remain inside Afghanistan, or they try and uh, create problems for the Taliban on Afghan soil, which is not going to happen. So uh, the, from this perspective, in my mind, at least TTP finds itself in a two-front war scenario. And uh, this explains why uh, Nurwali Masood has pledged allegiance to the Emir of the, uh, of the Taliban. Um, this has never happened before because the TTP had pledged allegiance before until now Taliban, uh, the TTP's allegiance was with Al-Qaeda. It was uh, with Eman uh, al-Zawairi, not with Hebatullah uh, Akhundzada. Okay, so uh, what do you suggest if uh, Shahid Raza should we take more questions or? Uh... Yeah, okay, we can we can take more questions if. if Actually, there are... we have more questions from students, and they are uh, literally taking so much interest in this uh, lecture. So I would like to ask Dilli Hassan uh, to please uh, speak and please speak up and ask your question. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and Shahid really enjoyed your point of views. Uh, my question is, is that the biggest challenge for the Taliban now is going to be the economy. How do you think they are going to run the country, given the fact that uh, the West is not going to trust them and they're going to create a lot of problems for them? If the West creates problems for them, it will create problems for the West. Because the only guarantee that the Americans have managed to secure from the Taliban is that Afghan soil is not going to be conducive to the Al-Qaeda fighters. If Afghanistan collapses economically, it is going to make environment for Al-Qaeda more conducive, just like it did in the late 90s, as I have already explained. So in that context, it is in the benefit of the West to invest in Afghanistan, to have uh, at least working relationship with the Taliban. And uh, let me take you back to the recent statement by the British Chief of Defense Staff, uh, General Nick Carter, uh, in which he has stated that uh, uh, the Taliban have evolved and it will be better if the uh, British state were to work with the Taliban on a, on a reform agenda. So basically, there are a lot of voices in the West that want to work with the Taliban. And frankly speaking, everybody, everybody likes a tough guy. You know, Anybody who can uh, implement the, uh, the demands that the West has put forward in Doha Accords, if they are going to be implemented, there's going to be an economic offset. Uh, because um, yeah, without, an diplomatic, uh, without an economic offset, Afghanistan is going to go back into chaos. If it goes back into chaos, it's, it's going to become conducive to all kinds of groups that want to attack the West. So it's a, it's a security paradigm that the Western countries have, do understand. And I, I at least do not think that um, there's going to be an economic siege of the Taliban government. Um, another aspect is China. China is very much willing to invest in Afghanistan. As I've already told you, China, is, uh, China has, a, has an emerging tech industry uh, that is reliant on rare earth minerals, um, especially batteries. And Afghanistan has the largest reserve of lithium in the world, um, estimated to be between one to three trillion dollars. So um, I think uh, China, uh, even more so from a security perspective, because China faces a significant threat from ETIM and um, 
ETIM has been uh, connected to uh, the TTP in the past. It's been a hulk of TTP, a circle of TTP, right? So um, the uh, the interesting perspective is that China might trade some security guarantees in return for economic assistance and investments. And then there is also part of Russia because Russia is very interested in upon minerals. It is very interested in exp exploring oil and gas um, uh, reserves inside of Afghanistan. Uh, it is also interested in building a gas pipeline all the way to Pakistan and India from, uh, from Russia. Right. Okay, Shahid, we have a very different question this time from Hiba Iman, student of PSIR first semester, uh, DHS of our university. And she wants to know that, uh, what do you think that social media as always is portraying an image of Afghanistan that doesn't even exist anymore? It's all about US soldiers helping them get out of the place, but no one is talking about the Taliban's and their progress. Um, seems like Western media is fooling everyone. What is your opinion? Uh, can you can you kind of rationalize the question? I haven't been able to understand what she's asking. Uh, the crux of her question is uh, she just wants to know about the social media or the mainstream media's image portraying of Afghanistan problem or especially about the Taliban. Um, I think it's not a question because uh, the portrayal of the Taliban in the media have been very, it has been very persistent. They've been receiving negative press for 30 years. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, if you see it, Taliban are actually trying to um, rebrand. going to change a bit? Uh, yes, it is starting yes. to change. I was I was on BBC three days ago, and um, uh, they were kind of uh, portraying the Taliban in a very different light. I mean, um, you must have seen that the, the Taliban representative, Suhail Shaheen, is uh, being accepted on Indian television. He's being accepted on CNN. He's being accepted on BBC. He's being accepted on CGTN, on TRT. There is definitely change as far as the Taliban's portrayal is concerned, because what happens is if you manage to, to change the ground realities of a conflict, perception is going to follow. Perception cannot create ground realities. Ground realities creates perceptions. Uh, so definitely media, is it going to change in the future? Almost certainly, yes. Okay, Mohsen Adin from DSIR second semester has a question. And uh, he is asking about the role of Pakistan in this uh, ongoing situation. Will Pakistan help Taliban forming a government or stand with the United States of America? I think it's a very simple question. <laughs> um, Mohsen, uh, the United States of America is part of this process. Okay. Uh, whatever, whatever is happening in Afghanistan is happening with the tacit approval of the Americans. They paved the way for this. Anthony Blinken called uh, Ashraf Ghani a day before he left and he told him to, to get out of Afghanistan and he did. So Americans are certainly involved in, uh, in, in the evolutionary pol political evolution process in, in Afghanistan. And uh, whether Pakistan is going to help or not, it depends on if Afghans uh, can you know, find a form a consensus because Pakistan, what Pakistan would like to see is a consensus-based government in Afghanistan that is Afghan-led, Afghan-driven government. Uh, Pakistan's role in Afghanistan has always been the role of an enabler. We do not want to dictate or lead what Afghan, Afghanistan should do. Uh, we have recently, uh, here in Islamabad, we recently hosted um, a high-powered delegation of various Afghan factions, including Tajiks, uh, Uzbeks, and Pashtuns, uh, to come together, and indeed Taliban representatives and representatives of Hizb Islami to come together and uh, try and formulate a new architecture for the future of one government. That is what we can do. Oh, Pakistan, yeah. Pakistan is never going to take uh, um, an overt uh, role because this is not Pakistan's role. Uh, we would want international community to recognize uh, that whatever government comes into power um, and only then Pakistan will take the initiative. Uh, Shahid, I really appreciate your patience because we are still having some questions uh, like Amin Hussain has asked that, uh, um, do you think that the United States of America were able to achieve its objectives in Afghanistan? Uh, I think I've, uh, I've already answered this question to an extent. Any question, sir? All right. And the last one, I just have to check that. What do you think there is Pakistan standing in relation with Afghanistan, Afghan Taliban? Because back in 1990s, they were Mujahideen for us, and then we called them terrorists and militant. And now, again, we are trying to rebrand them. So um, 
what kind of a relationship Pakistan and uh, Afghan Taliban are going to have? Uh, who, who, uh, who is asking this question? Initially, they were Marathi team, then they became no, terrorists. Sorry, who's, who's um, asking Fatima this question? Kiran. Fatima Kiran, okay. Uh, I would like to ask Fatima, can you please tell me when exactly Pakistan has declared Taliban as terrorists? We have never done that, by the way. Pakistan has never done that. Um, the Afghan Taliban have never been on uh, the list of international terrorist organizations, even of the U.S. State Department. So it, it would be better if uh, it is seen in a broader uh, context. This is simply not true. Even American government has never uh, regarded the Taliban as uh, a terrorist organization because they understood that they were going to have to negotiate with the same people when they had to exit. Taliban have never been on a terrorist list, international list of terrorism. The TTP is on uh, the international international list of terrorist organizations. And uh, we are not trying to rebrand the Taliban. They are trying to rebrand themselves. It is their country. They have to run it. We, our role is just the role of an enabler. Uh, we are doing it because of our own interests. We do not want to have an unstable region. We do not want to have a fault refugee crisis. Uh, we do not want to have um, a region where India can uh, India can intervene and uh, encircle Pakistan in a strategic way. So Pakistan has its own interests. It does not. It, it is not as simple as uh, Pakistan is trying to rebrand the Taliban and you know, etc. So uh, it, it's it, it's it's an effort on the behalf of the Afghan Taliban it's themselves that they are trying to rebrand themselves into a uh, into an acceptable form of government by the international community, and that is exactly what's going to happen. All right. So uh, we have taken almost all the questions, and, and I really want to uh, pay my uh, regards and my thanks to Shahid Raza for your time and for your interest in um, talking to our audience and uh, getting engaged with us. Uh, it was a wonderful learning from um, of all of us, not just for the students, but for myself also, because I never studied Afghanistan in uh, so much of in that depth. So I really appreciate your presence. I really appreciate for your time. And Shira, we'll, we will be connected uh, for the next sessions um, with the new development in this region. Thanks a lot. Um, and I really want to pay my thanks from DHS of us and University side. Also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak to your students. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot.